Welcome to Doctors at Work. My name is Matt Daniel and this podcast is part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers. Today's topic is how to be a great communicator and I'm having a discussion with Felicity Dwyer. Now of course communication is a key skill for all of us as doctors and it's particularly important for those of us that work within teams or that have leadership roles. Felicity tells me that her top tips are be a good listener, be flexible with your communication style and health self-awareness. We talk about what gets in the way of good listening and good communication and also on how one can adapt to different people and to different preferences for communication in a way that we bring everybody into the conversations that we have. Welcome Felicity, tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you Matt. I'm a professional facilitator, trainer and coach. I've been working in learning development for over 20 years and I specialise in helping people develop team leadership skills with a particular focus on effective communication. And the topic for us today is how to be a great communicator. Um, And of course, that's very relevant to all of us as doctors because we communicate with colleagues, people above us, below us, sideways, various teams, various other professionals, as well as the patients that we serve all the time. So um, we're going to focus on that kind of teamwork and leadership communication. And what makes a great communicator? I think there's a few foundational aspects. And first and foremost, it's being a good listener. If you can't listen well, you can't communicate well. You can't hear the language people use. You can't hear people's perspectives and respond to that. So that's my absolute foundational skill, being a good listener. And secondly, I think you need to be flexible in your communication. We all have different communication styles and something that feels comfortable to you might not resonate with another person. So just being aware of how people seem to prefer to communicate can help you responding in kind and make it more likely that you know what you're saying will be heard. And the third and also really important the underpinning aspect is self-awareness. So that's becoming aware, for example, of triggers you may have, things that may cause you to react emotionally, which can get in the way of clarity in response. Um, or biases that you might have, which we all have by nature of, you know, having a brain. (laughs) Um, So things that might get in the way. And the more you can be aware of them, uh, the more you can make allowances for them. You can understand where you might not be fully, fully able to listen. So, you know, that that underpins it all, I think. Self-awareness, listening skills and then flexibility and response. Let's go through each of those one by one. You know, let's start with them. listening skills because I don't know I don't know what your normal workplace is like but so often we're so busy time is really pressured or decisions have to be made really quickly everybody's rushing you know from one meeting or from one thing to the next or from one patient to the next Um, and it, it feels like it feels like finding somebody to listen is is quite a rarity um, I mean what is a good listener what makes a good listener and how do we encourage good listening Oh, great question. I think there's a couple of things. I think firstly, and this will be one of my top tips, is that as an individual, we need to take responsibility um, to improve our listening. And that includes becoming aware of the things that get in the way for you. And they're different for everybody. Some people are quite you know, distracted by external things going on. And that can that can be that can get in the way. Sometimes it's internal things. It's just too much thinking, too many things you've got to do. So there's lots of different barriers and we'll all recognize some of them. So it's recognizing that in yourself and finding a way when you're with somebody of bringing your intent, your attention back to the person. So I almost imagine if I can feel my attention being drawn somewhere else of physically pulling it back. And that works for me. For someone else, it might be having a little mantra, you know, listen now, Um, something that brings you back to that present moment and being with the person. And something that I found really powerful, it's not a technique. I'm not sure that listening techniques help. I think what really helps is the intention. So to go in with your conversation, remind yourself, I'm going to listen to this person. Um, So that's one thing. It's in yourself. Also within a team, and I appreciate we're all busy, we all have too many meetings, but really thinking about how can you structure a meeting so that everybody has time to be heard, so that everybody gets the opportunity to contribute their perspective and 
making sure there's some kind of structure around that so somebody doesn't dominate the meeting time. And so something really simple, like just going around and saying, you know, for each person, you've got a minute or two just to tell me your thoughts on this. Go around, then open it up briefly to, OK, any other thoughts that have been triggered by that? It just can provide. I mean, you might think, oh, it's more people speaking. But, you know, if the meetings aren't too big, if team meetings aren't too big, actually giving a structured but time limited space for everybody to contribute allows more ideas to get put on the table and then you use a little bit of time at the end and you can actually use the time more effectively the one person taking all the meeting time others feeling they haven't had a chance people not listening because they're just thinking when can I get my viewpoint but if people know they're going to have an opportunity to speak it paradoxically can make it easier to listen some of the meetings that I've been in you know they have been exactly as you've outlined dominated by a number of people often it's me felicity that sort of that nominates meetings at least i've got self-awareness some of it at least so i've already moved to point three um but this, i think one of the challenges that that sometimes i find is that um that you know th there's a meeting and th there are a number of people that are very dominant and they do all the talking um and and other people don't so you know what what stops people from contributing or what how can we how do we change you know a team meeting to make sure that everybody gets to contribute okay again that's a really good question and it will fundamentally come down to a good facilitator or chair so if you are a team leader um then either learn how to facilitate well um or you can, you know, you can rotate the facilitation role. It doesn't always have to be the team leader who facilitates. But as I said before, I think it's really useful to have a structure. If you've got a larger meeting, something that can be helpful is before everybody speaks, invite people to share with one colleague. So give them a couple of minutes to share with a colleague. What are your thoughts on this? Because some people find that easier in a smaller, you know, in a pair or a smaller group. Also, um, for the meeting with the agenda, um, people won't want to read a lot of information before agenda. But if you just put the key questions that you're going to discuss, um, phrasing them in the form of questions, and this is a, a technique from Nancy Klein, um, can help people to start thinking ahead of the meeting. Or even if you've asked a question, giving people a minute just to make some notes before asking people to contribute. And the reason is that just helps people who have a, a more introverted thinking style, who um, need to think before they speak, rather than some people, they, they think as they speak, the speaking helps them think. Yeah. Other people, giving people a little bit of time to think first can help um, encourage contributions for them. And as I said before, I think it's really important to actually offer everybody a chance to contribute by name, if, mm -hmm you know, the meeting is the size to allow it. They don't have to contribute. They might say, I've got nothing to add, but it's that inviting people in by name because there's evidence that if you don't do that, it is a small number, as you said, that will dominate. Mm -hmm. And um, the more some people dominate, particularly if they're senior, you know, if, if, if senior people speak early on, it makes it harder for more junior people on the team to, you know, to feel that they can contribute. So that's one aspect of it. Um, I could say more, but I'll I'll stop now. <laughs> so I, I guess the key the key thing there then is you know if you are a senior member in the team, then you know if we, we said that, that the key to being a great communication communicator is listening. So you know if you are a senior member of the team, you know start by listening rather than sort of start start by talking. One of the challenges I think with with listening um, is, is you know that time pressure. But I really like you know your comment that that there's intentionality behind it that that, that you consciously choose. Um, to prioritize that you know not there's no particular sort of magic skill or behavior or something that you do but it's just a conscious decision that you are going to pay attention and you are, are going to listen to the person in front of you um, mm -hmm. and I guess when you know everybody's life is so busy you know what why does listening matter so much it matters because um and you'll know this as a coach of course that when you're listening to somebody it can help the other person think better and Nancy Klein calls this uh, generative listening. I think it comes from the work of David Bone initially. Um, so listening to people can help them think better. It also creates a sense of safety within, within the team. And one uh, model I find quite helpful is um, Patrick Lencioni's uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he talks about if you want to have a really high-performing, cohesive team, 
fundamentally you need to establish trust and you do that by giving people space to speak and share what's going on for them um, for willing sometimes to be a bit vulnerable and open as a leader as well you know you, you might not have all the answers um, and by doing that you can create an environment where people feel more comfortable in saying look I don't agree with this or I'm not sure this will work or I have a different view so listening to people with respect with mutual respect uh, making it known that you really do want to hear what people say um, that can help build a, a trust within the team so you know, it's all in service of building trust and people then feeling it's OK to say what I think, even if it's it different to what to what the leader says. Or have you thought about this? Or, um, you know, in my experience, patients struggle with this. You know, sometimes people just have a different perspective because of their different level in the organisation. So it's really being open to that. I think there's a balance between, you know, if you're a doctor, you're an, you're an expert, obviously, has, but as as a team leader or team member, there's also a need to bring in a, a, you know, a humility, if you like, to balance it a little bit as well, to say, well, I don't know everything. There's other people in the team who have something really valuable to say, and I'm curious. Mm -hmm. um, that's my other tip, being curious, just interested a little bit about, oh, I wonder, you know, how she sees it. What does it look like from his perspective? And mm -hmm. I think bringing that in um, really does you know, it just helps and people can feel it. You know, I talked about that self-awareness, you know, it it's not so much a set of behaviours you put on. It's it's something that you really try and bring in and think, well, OK, I'm going to try and stay interested a little bit longer. I think that's quite difficult to do, or at least for some people, you know, if people have spent 20 years developing their career, you know, they become a senior doctor in whatever area they are and then to go from there from being you know a real recognized expert in whatever you do to then all of a sudden saying you know you know i wonder what what so and so things i wonder what so and so things and everybody's thinking like why does matt want to know like what what i think you know sort of he's the consultant or, or he's the boss so you know why 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 do those kind of things matter um i think they really do matter because they're part of what's been shown to be more effective as a leadership style. Um, so if I can bring in a little bit more theory, um, a, a leadership book that I love <laughs> is The New Leaders by Daniel Goleman, which is based on emotional intelligence. And he talks about different leadership styles. So um, a couple of the styles that he calls dissonant styles, which are styles that can cause a lack of harmony within the team, are the commanding style, which is effectively when you're telling people what to do, or the pace setting style where you're really setting that fast pace. And it can be very effective with um, a very skilled, high performing team. Um, I mean, you know, you may be a style that works in surgery. You, you, you have the expertise to, to comment on that. Um, but if that is your only style, if you're always coming in as the expert when it comes to teamwork, then um, people can end up feeling almost like a little bit anxious and on edge all the time, and that affects performance. So Goldman talks about some of the other styles that have been shown to be more effective. For example, um, the visionary style, which encourages people to see um, where the team could go, or the coaching style, which focuses on developing people, or the affiliative style, which is about, you know, helping to build good relations within the team. And he calls some of those styles resonant styles because um, it's where a leader's attuned to the feelings of the group and it can encourage people to just feel a little bit safer. And of course, when we feel safer, we're more a we're better able to think logically, um, you know, we're just more relaxed. So it's really the case of do, do people feel relaxed enough to do their best thinking, make good decisions? Um, so it really, really does does matter within a team setting that you, um, you know, that you bring as much emotional intelligence, if you like, as you can. So even if somebody is a senior leader and the only thing they're interested in is is performance and, you know, outcomes, you know, speed, clinical outcomes, whatever it might be, there's a recognition that actually listening and giving everybody space to talk, you know, that's something that supports you know, the overall vision that might be, you know, efficient, transformation, patient care, whatever, whatever that vision might be. I'm interested in these different um, leadership styles, you know, are these things that are exclusive or, or, of each other sort of, or, I mean, maybe we're moving into flexibility, you know, how does one move between those different styles? You know, when is it, when are they good? How do you choose where you go? 
Okay, um, it's, a, it's a great question. And a good, le a good leader will be flexible in the styles that they can bring to a situation. So if you've got an emergency situation, which is clearly sometimes the case um, in, 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 in clinical situations, then quite a, a commanding style can be very effective. You just need people to be here, there and get things done. So it's absolutely effective there. Um, however, a good leader will know when that's not needed, when the team know what they need to do already. So therefore, it just might be a case of checking and, you know, do you need support from anyone in the team at the moment? So it's being able to flex between styles. And that comes back to that point of self-awareness, like where are you most comfortable and where could you develop further? You know, what what could you try? Um, so it, it it does require flexibility. It's but it starts with the self recognition, which isn't isn't always easy. I mean, I've certainly come across people who are pace setters and think they're really democratic. So you know, people don't always know. So you have to be willing to be open to feedback. And again, this can be challenging if you're used to being the expert to actually um, be open to actually what could I be doing better. And uh, Jennifer Garvey Berger um, has a question in her book, Leadership Mind Traps, and she talks about, um, I think the question is, how could I be wrong? And she said, this stops people getting into the state of, you know, who I am now preventing me from being who I could be. So I may have a leadership style that works in some situations, but where does it not work? And therefore, you know, how could I be more? How could I have more options available? So it's that you know, it's that being willing, willing to be uncomfortable by suddenly realising there's some areas where you could be better. But once you've realised that, you've got the chance to change and improve and continue to grow um, as a leader and person. I hope you're enjoying the show. Please click subscribe so you'll be notified when new episodes become available. This podcast is part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers. You can be part of that mission too by forwarding this show to one person who you think might benefit from listening. Thank you. Now on with the show. It, it sounds as an unknown unknown that, that you know people will have one leadership style, you know, what, whatever that came from. Or well, in fact, maybe, you know, where, where, where do our leadership behaviours and where, do, where does our communication behaviour, where does it all come from? Mm. I suspect the answer from, for that starts in the family of, of origin, doesn't it? And what we, what, what we observe and there's cultural issues involved. Um, so, yeah, there's, I think that's a, a complex question. I don't think there's a simple answer to that one. So wherever it comes from, you know, we, we develop one style of communicating and one style of leadership or, you know, or some of us will. But I guess that, that some of us won't won't realize that 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 might serve us in some circumstances. And, you know, perhaps we've maybe we've honed it to perfection because, you know, because it serves us in one particular um, um setting and you know maybe at least if i think sort of you know in, in surgery that kind of very directive you know that that's really really useful sort of you know if you're the person that's in charge of an emergency situation um but it's a terrible style when it comes sort of to trying to you know develop a new project or engage the team in something that, that that's transformative so um i mean how how, how do i know whether i have insight or not oh <laughs> um it's I think there's a few things I mean the reflective practice um yeah. so actually re reflecting on you know how did that go what did I learn what could I have done differently is important and you can do that with a coach so someone like yourself or um with a journal so I think ha taking a bit of reflective practice the Chartered Management Institute calls reflective practice a high level leadership skill um but again if if you've been quite externally focused um it's it's a little bit of a shift to do it, to actually take that step back and look at myself. So that's one aspect, whether you do it with a coach or whether you do it through reflection or, you know, you'll have different kinds of supervision, obviously. Um, the other way is is through feedback and finding ways to gather feedback. And of course, that can be done, you know, at the organisational level, such as a, a 360 process. It can be done through asking your team and direct reports be mindful that people sometimes are reluctant to give 
critical feedback to a more senior person. So think about how you phrase it. It's a lot easier if you phrase it along the lines of, you know, is there anything more I could be doing to, to manage you better? Um, so inviting constructive um, suggestions rather than criticism, because that, that tends to be a bit easier for people. And also it's the other thing when it comes to feedback is just being aware of your own reactions to feedback. So if you hear something that hits you and you think, oh, wasn't expecting that or it's it's that's not good. I don't, I don't like that. You know, making sure you take a breath and don't react to it. Give it a little bit of time. Think about it. Uh, I mean, it may not be fair. Somebody's feedback is only one person's opinion. But if somebody does offer you some feedback, you know, take the time to reflect on it. Maybe talk it through with someone you trust. Um, you know, see it as something useful. Yeah, I think that that's the key, isn't it? Is that that it's what somebody thinks, you know, of me or you or somebody else. And and I mean, chances are that not everybody in the world will like everyone. Yeah, I mean, that's reality, isn't it? Um, but it's it's kind of thinking what what does that say about how people perceive me or whoever whoever is is asking for feedback. The particular thing when I, whenever I do any courses or anything, um, I tend to, to ask you know what what was good, what would you what would you like more of, what would you like less of, and sort of and that kind of those kind of three questions strike me as being relevant in this context because because it's not about on a scale of one to ten how brilliant is felicity yeah you know or what are felicity's weaknesses or matt's weaknesses it's not about that but it's it's you know what what could felicity or what could matt do more of what could matt do less of that there's no particular judgment implied in that and maybe that makes it easier for me to process or for you to process or for somebody else to process but more importantly it probably gives it easier for people to give feedback um because otherwise you know, people, most of us will try and be positive with each other, won't we? And, you know, and that's fine, but but it might not be what actually a leader looks for, because, you know, because if a leader is trying to develop, they want developmental feedback, not not stuff that just massages their ego. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like this idea of, of being flexible. And, you know, you talked before also about being flexible in communication style in the different people, different people benefit from different ways of communication can you tell me a bit more maybe give me some examples about different communication styles yes absolutely um the model i tend to use for this is called disc and i quite you know like, like a lot of these models you know you can do um, more in depth <laughs> more in depth versions but if you're thinking of a model that you can just use to help you day to day um, the simple version of it thinks of um, four different communication styles really and the idea is you start by thinking well what are my communication styles or preferences so it's a behavioral model we're not trying to analyze personality but what are my styles or preferences and um, what are other people that I work with what do I think their styles or preferences are um, and is there a way that I can adjust what I do to adapt to them? Okay. Um, so I'll just I'll just give you some examples. So you've got a direct communication style. People who are communication directly want to keep it short, clear, and to the point. Yeah. Um, so it's a very useful style, obviously, in emergency situations, but it can be perceived by others who don't share this preference as being quite abrupt or yeah. you know, even rude particularly yeah. they don't know the person. So if that's your style, you might think, okay, what do I need to do to adjust, to soften a little bit with, with people who don't respond so well to this style? Yeah. Um, or if you have a colleague who has this style, you know, and you haven't, you yeah. might want to think to yourself, okay, I need to do a bit of my thinking before I ask them for something so that I can keep it concise and clear and they will ask me if they want more information. Okay. So it's two ways. It's recognizing is that my style, or is there a colleague who has that style, and therefore I can adapt. You, you've you've nailed me to a T, Felicity. I sort of <laughs> I think I'm interested in what the others are, but 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 that's totally me. And I'm and I'm laughing because whenever people send me an email, I always think, what do you want from me? And I kind of and I always think, why do you just tell me what you want from me? Number one and number two, whenever I send the email, the feedback that I normally get is, can I put some kisses on the end? And sort of and maybe a please and a thank you rather than just a yes, yeah. But for for me, it's like well, just it's a, it's a yes or a no. Sort of so it's like why do I need to put kisses? 
messages on the end of emails. But um, but yeah, so some sometimes if I, that reminds me next time that I send my secretary an email, I need to put some kisses on the end. So because that's what she likes at the end of the email. So okay, so so what? Okay, so tell me more. You know what? What are the others then? What are the other styles? Okay, I'll go through the the styles. Um, I go through an influencing style. So I have quite a lot of this in my uh, makeup. So an influence is quite an outgoing style. And it's quite a people focused style. Um, so an influencer will like to sort of think things through by talking. They're probably quite confident speaking in a meeting and they might like presenting. Um, so that that's the style. So the, the way to engage with people who have an influencer style is ask some questions, making it very two way. Mm -hmm. um, they will switch off if they're talked at for too long. But mm -hmm. if it's engaging and two way, um, you know, they'll feel much, much more involved and more likely to, you know, to be happy with what's being discussed. Um, so both of those styles are quite outgoing styles, the direct and the influencing. Can, can I just pause for listening? Because that also sounds like me. So is it possible that we're in different groups at the same time? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. And, and you know, you can, you can be close to the border. I mean, I'm actually an IS, so I'm between the I and the S style. Um, so people may use comfortably use more than one style and you you do have to be careful if you're using the model just as a rule of thumb you know you can't know for sure people's preferences you can just pick up on clues from you yeah. know, speaking with them yeah. um so the, the the next two styles are more reserved styles so um the steady style is a people focused but more reserved style and these are the people who like the kisses who like the how was your weekend and you know like those real sort of social interactions um and the people with the s s style they will not tend to like being put on the spot so they're the people at meetings that might need a little bit of thinking time or just to clarify their ideas with a partner first um then you can get more out of of s style people and i i work with you know, when I've done training in with, with in the NHS, um, I've found quite a lot of S-star people uh, within the NHS setting. And the fourth style is the, the conscientious style. And that's, again, it's a, a little more reserved and it's a more task-focused style. So like the direct style, it's quite task-focused. And these people are quite good on detail. Um, they like reassurance can be a bit risk averse want all the information before they make a decision um so again if you're communicating with somebody with this conscientious style it's probably not effective to push them too much into a decision before they've had a chance to think things through um if you are a conscientious style of communicator be careful not to give people too much detail. Um, you know, you need to be able to pull out the key points to communicate effectively. And um, that's the main challenge I see with conscientious style is you get an awful lot of detail and, um, you know, pe people can switch off a bit if, if they're not so, so detail focused. Um, so e each style has its, its benefits, but if you can be flexible and uh, adjust the way you communicate, it will it will have more impact and it's 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 quite fun when you start knowing about these stars you can notice them in emails and you know you can you can start making making assumptions but be aware that they are just assumptions that's the thing um you ultimately you'll only know if your communication is effective by the response so if you try something a bit different and you get a good response think oh that's working with this person um if you don't get a great response you know try something different or yeah. you know and I'm liking this idea of understanding um, the the other person because again, you know, if I kind of think, you know, with my email example, you know, when people send me email and I think, oh, just tell me what you want me to do, um, and and then particularly if that sort of comes from somebody who's conscientious, who, who does give me sort of an enormous amount of details, and I kind of quickly trying to to read through emails, you know, like what what do I need to do, and sort of and 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 none the wiser. So. So is that is that you know when you talk about flexibility, is that understanding you know where where in those four, if we use that as a model, where in those four might I sit for preference, and where might other people sit for preference, and then and then adjusting. So in my mind, I've kind of got a four by four matrix as to as to what does a D person have to do with an S person, and you know what does an I person have to do with a C person. Is that sort of is that kind of how that how it sort of works? How we adjust to each other. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it it it's it's firstly recognizing your own preferences, then um, adjusting to other people. And there's there's good. I mean, I use the um, 
everything disc sometimes in programs um, insights discovery is a very well-known version of the model that some people use so it can be useful to, to to use the actual questionnaire within the team because then you'll get a lot more information yeah. you know about what people's styles are you but but the the reason i like the model is you, you don't have to know everybody's style to be able to use the model as a way of thinking okay I can see that if I put this person on the spot, I'm not getting a good response. So maybe I'll try, um, you know, giving her a bit more thinking time or saying something I'd appreciate as you come into the meeting with some thoughts about this and just notice, am I getting a better contribution from, from the person? Yeah. So, you know, it's, you, you can see the model and you can map people and you can try things. Um, but just be aware that you don't know for sure. I, but it's it's useful, and it's it's you know I, I find people find it quite enlightening. I mean, I've talked about it briefly in my book. Um, there's you know lots of different models out there, as I said of this. The basic disc model isn't copyrighted, copyright. So that's why I've covered it in my book. But yes. there's various proprietary people have developed their own versions with their own names that you know you can usually pay a small fee and get a um, a diagnostic of your own style or the team style yeah so um i like the idea then that, that we're all different and you know and, and i've got a preferred communication style wherever that's come from um but uh, but you and other people around me will have their own preferred communication style and then it's about it's about sort of how we adjust to each other to make sure that we get um the the, the best because again you know if i use sort of you know my my example you know with, with with the emails is is you know that that somebody likes me to put kisses and i and i kind of think like why and you know somebody else sort of write writes lots and lots of details and you know that that kind of frustrates me but equally uh, i see the value in kisses in emails and likewise i see the value in sort of in somebody who produces a really really detailed outline a really detailed email that looks at everything so there's real value um in in, in all of that yeah and 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 that you know, recognizing that we're all different and that means that we are making different contributions to the team as a whole. And, you know, and if we were all presumably, if we were all, you know, I don't know, you know, if we, if we were all in that, um, um, what was it, conven conventional, what was, what was the C again, last category? Conscientious. Conscientious, that's it. So, you know, if we were all, if we're all the same, yeah, I mean, what, would, would that be a problem if everybody in the team was a C or everybody was a D or an I or an S? Would that be a problem? Would that be good or bad? I, I think it could lead to problems. You could, I mean, I what I, what I want to not get into is, this, you know, turning this into a personality assessment yeah. rather than a communication yeah. Yeah. assessment, although some people do yeah. think it's personality, but I, I I don't see it that way. I see it very much the behavioural styles. I think yeah. if you've got too many Ds, you could have very terse communication. Um, yeah. You know, too many Ss, perhaps there would be not enough focus on task because you've got this because you've got the task and people focus. Um, yeah. You know, having a mix of people who are more focused on the task and more focused on you know the people and relationships. You know, can be healthy if we find a way to work together. If we go back to the the, the Point you made earlier about you know you've got a maybe a senior person a senior doctor who is very task focused outcome focused which is great however it's important to have more people focused people in the team who can help create that that yeah. trust and you know it's it's if we just had task focused people it could be quite a cold working environment we'd lose something um so i think there's benefits to having yeah. having different types of people within a team and people are attracted to certain roles perhaps because of their um you know their their interest in detail or because they like speaking to people mm. you know you may get quite a lot of coaches for example that are quite people focused but not necessarily all mm. so yeah you, again you'll you'll get you get accountants who are c types you'll get accountants who are who are not you know it's I, li I like that idea that 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 you know there's, there's there's a role for people might have preferences and and there's something to be said for for adapting to each other and being conscious of what our own preferences are and you talked about flexibility so we talk about flexibility as in how i how i adjust to you or you know how the two of us adjust our preferred um, behaviorals but presumably flexibility also means adapting to different situations yes Yes. So are you thinking of a specific example? 
Well, you know, we talked about the idea there's an emergency situation and, and there's there's a type of communication that, that works well for that, you know, or we're talking about, you know, a project that's around service reconfiguration transformation and, and that will need a very different style of communication. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree. So if you if you say you're developing something new, you might be wanting to use quite a democratic style, bring into different people's views. If you've got conflict within the team, um, you might be needing to help people resolve that by creating quite a safe space for people to be heard and actually air the conflicts, thinking about how people can word it so it doesn't become personal attacks, but it comes more um, an expression of you know concerns. So it's and that's a different skill set to just being very clear in issuing tasks. Um, so, yes, absolutely different, different skills. And I think this is where um, you do not have to be good at everything to be a good leader. Um, there's a Harvard Business Review article, I think it's called In Praise of the Incomplete Leader, which talks about um, the idea that you have to be a leader and brilliant at everything is not correct a good leader knows their strengths and also you know knows whether the other people within the team who can step up and perhaps lead in certain areas so again it comes back to that self-awareness and not trying to be good at everything to build the skills you need to be better and also knowing you know where does leadership lie maybe the leadership of this project needs to lie with somebody who's who's really strong in that skill set yeah. so that's also a a leadership skill really distributing knowing knowing people um we're kind of moving into into the third thing which was around you know self-awareness you know what 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 am i good at or you know what what the leader is good at and and if i think that the when it comes to communication i guess the the telling you know, where i've seen problems i've seen maybe issues where where you know people had one one way of doing stuff and no matter what the situation sort of the same thing so that kind of you know maybe links into the fact that that person wasn't particularly flexible which is problem number one but problem number two they they didn't realize that sort of the different stuff is going on um, for different people um, and then also i've also seen people where they have they have no idea what they leave behind yeah, sort of, you know, I think, you know, we talk about the shadow effect, yeah, that, you know, somebody comes and does something and then they leave and, you know, they leave a shadow behind and that person doesn't necessarily know that they've got that. So um, we touched upon a little bit about self-awareness, but can you tell me a bit more about how, how um, I guess, sort of what, what one does with, with that? Because, you know, we talked about the idea of reflecting um, mm -hmm. and paying attention to what's going on. We talked about the idea of um of a 360 yeah anything else to say about self-awareness or have we covered it i think it does um it is important to aware to be aware that we all have blind spots and i think most people think that they're quite self-aware um you know i like to think i'm quite self-aware uh however you have to sort of accept if, if you accept that everybody has a blind has blind spots, then um, that's when you can be open to it. Because I think what can get in the way of self-awareness can be the fact that, well, I already have it. I'm very self-aware and I, I have heard this sometimes. And the fact is, and this is where coaching is so powerful, of course, because sometimes it's a question. Somebody asks you just a gentle question. You realize you don't know how to answer it. And that that can can be quite, you know quite quite insightful so i think that there is a certain need to be open to, open to it i think this is some, almost a prerequisite for um thinking well what don't i what don't i ne yet know and sometimes um joe harry window models one i find quite helpful here because it, it, it talks about our blind spots which can be grown um or reduced rather through feedback and then it talks about you know the open area which is the part of ourselves that we show up and then I think there's a hidden area, which is the part that we choose not to show, perhaps. So that could be some of our vulnerabilities or insecurities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes appropriate disclosure of those can be helpful at work. Not always it has to be appropriate disclosure. But also there is a, a hidden area. And these are things that we don't know, but others don't know about us. And they may not emerge until a situation triggers them. So, for example, um, you know, it could be a 
a personal crisis that we go through and it's not until we're tested that we actually realize you know maybe we're stronger than we thought or maybe um we're not as confident as we we thought we were and maybe this you know and and we don't know until circumstances test us um so you know feedback and self-reflection self-development coaching are the two main methods that i think we can look for but life itself will will throw up tests and if we're open to learning from it if we have that growth mindset oh this is an opportunity to learn something it's uncomfortable but i can learn from it then you know like life life will give us give us those opportunities we're all work in progress oh we are yeah i wonder if i could bring us to a close felicity maybe if i could ask you to summarize you know what would be your top tips for doctors at work uh, yes, so my, my my top tips are to um, firstly to learn to listen really well, um, and it doesn't need to take more time than not listening. Um, in fact, you know, it allows you to take information in first time. Um, to recognise that your preferred style of communication is not probably the only one, and be aware of you know how you might make the most of people on the team by understanding you know their style. Do they need a bit more thinking time? Do they need a bit more detail? Do they need interaction and questions? Um, give feedback, good feedback and good feedback, um, which I don't think we talked about too much, but good feedback is really clear and evidence based. So you're providing evidence that this is the situation. Um, this is what, you know, I observed that you did. And this was the impact. Um, and then use that as a starting point for a conversation, you know, so um you know what did it look like from your perspective or um what might you do differently next time so use that to start a conversation um and i think the the last thing actually which i haven't talked about before but just seek seek peers you admire who you know might not be within your team but perhaps um in different roles elsewhere in the organization or similar roles or in other organizations you know get a good network of people who face some of the same challenges as you because they're probably approaching it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, so that's that can be really helpful. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.